Hello everybody. Let's talk a little bit about sensory thresholds. Uh, this in fact contains within it a homework assignment as well and you're probably pretty used to that approach by now. So uh, we're going to keep it short. We're going to talk about sensation and perception and let's start with this idea of sensation. It's, it's uh, what we sense is based on what is important to us uh, for us to respond to in the distant past. So uh, the weird thing about sensation is sensation is really directed by the attentional process but often non-conscious attention. Uh, and then if we perceive something of, of relative importance, it directs our sensory perception to it to a greater extent and the perception is then pushed into conscious awareness. So. What would you expect is important, let's say, to, to a dog based on its most important sense, right? And, and when we look at kind of the evolutionary history of dogs, we look at what makes a dog adapt to its environment, what makes a dog successful, and we see that it has a sense of cell that's easily 100,000 times more powerful than our sense of smell. But then notice that dogs often hunt at night where vision is not really all that useful, and sense of smell becomes almost everything uh, for both finding mating partners as well as finding food, locating one's offspring, which need to be nursed and protected. So we see a highly developed sense of s smell for a dog and, and it makes them very adaptive to the niche that they occupy. Right? A bird is probably going to have a different sensory apparatus. Let's suppose that you're uh, some kind of eagle, let's say a bald eagle, and you hunt rabbits per se. Right? So you, you hunt rabbits, but you do it from a distance which could be a mile up in the air. Uh, obviously that's going to then make different sensory apparatus more necessary to the comp successful completion of that task. So where dogs might favor smell, uh, we see in birds often it's vision as a primary component. What do you think is the most important sense for human beings? And that might be a trickier question than it appears. How many of you said, well, obviously vision is most important for a human being? And, you know, you could probably craft a really effective argument for that. But then I might offer a sense of touch as being very important to human beings as well, especially at our current state. We manipulate, right? <laughs> Homo habilis. We are the tool maker. We are the ones that are very tactile and uh, perform many functions with our fingers. So touch is probably extremely important as well, although often overlooked in, in that regard. Also, the sensation of being touched that is being caressed, uh, being patted on the back or whatever, has tremendous emotional significance for us and bonding uh, utility as well. So it's not always a, a straightforward question to answer. Now sensation versus perception, let's just get this, this kind of definitional difference out of the way. Sensation is what we take from our environment so it's the raw material of the perceptual process. Sensation is effectively us assessing some type of energy in our environment. That is, taking that energy, whether it's uh, from the electromagnetic spectrum, whether it's chemical energy uh, in the form of smell or taste, whether it's pressure energy in terms of, uh, of touch, the initial sensory apparatus measure the impact of that energy on us. Now, from that, all our sensory apparatus have the ability to convert that energy to neural impulses. Because let's face it, the brain only deals in one thing. It only deals in neural impulses, as you're well aware from the previous chapters that, that we've studied, right? So how does energy from the outside world become neural impulses that can be decoded and understood. And that's the process of transduction. And I, I love that word. We transduce one form of energy to another. So all the external energies, right, there's an array of those. But all of those will be transduced, translated, transformed, however you want to put it. But transduced is the cool word, right, will be transduced into neural impulses. And those neural impulses then are sent to areas of the brain, right, where they are then analyzed. And they're compared to our memories. They're compared to our motivation 
our current state of motivation, our needs, wants, right? It's a very complex process once we get to perception. Sensation is pretty much straight up. It's, it's energy transduced to neural impulses. What we do with those neural impulses is the complex issue. Right? So uh, we may then, in fact, taste a wine. I don't know if you guys, uh, I, I love wine tasting. I wanted to work in, a, in the wineries in my, in my late 20s. I moved to Northern California to do that. We already know about that story, right? Uh, but the tasting of wine and then a flood of recollections associated with that smell and that taste can, can come flooding back. But that's part of the perceptual process, right? Or, or maybe the wine that made us sick, and uh, hopefully you haven't been down that path as well. And, and notice that taste aversion, that is foods that have made us sick in the past, we often avoid uh, to a great extent uh, based on this memorial process that's instigated as, as part of perception. I wanted to make this homework assignment more fun, uh, keep it a little lighter, so we're, we're going to lead into that now. How we study the senses? Well, psychophysics, right? And the, the, notice, this, this, this is a physical sensation, right? So it really is the process of physics that's being translated into neural impulses that, in fact, allow us to perceive. Well, the, char the physical characteristics of the stimuli plus our sensory experience of the stimuli I is the broad area of psychophysics. There's a couple important concepts like absolute thresholds and different thresholds or just notable, noticeable difference that we need to explain as we're coming up. One of the first things we notice, though, is sensory adaptation. We acclimate to stimuli. So when we first walk into, let's, uh, let's leave a classroom. Remember what that's like? I know maybe a couple of you guys have classes, but for the most part, <laughs> or we're in a, a relatively darkened room. We've been watching PowerPoints on the screen, whatever. And, and then the professor says, OK, we're done for today. And we walk out into the bright light, and, and it's almost like the bright light knocks you back on your heels uh, because of the intensity of the light. But walk for a minute or two and suddenly our eyes adjust. We adapt our senses. Right? Odors do the same thing. We walk into somebody's home for dinner, you know, and they say, hey, come on over for dinner. They got something awesome cooking on the pot. And when you walk into the house, man, the smell just kind of assaults you. And again, maybe kind of just even rocks you back. But once you've been there a while, then you become acclimated. That is, you become desensitized to a certain extent. So that's one principle then of, of perception is that over time, our perception of a stimulus, if the stimulus remains unchanged, our perception then shows the stimulus uh, at, at a lower and lower level. Sensory adaptation, the fancy term. Right? So. What happened, we're designed to sense change better than stagnation. And, and changes indicate opportunities in the environment, and changes indicate th potential threats in the environment. So you can see that the system is biased adaptively towards change rather than continually assessing this as the same, this is the same, this is the same. That doesn't bias a lot. But noticing changes in the environment can yield great uh, great gains or potentially help us avoid uh, threats. Right? So your friend's perfume might seem a little overwhelming when you first smell it. Let's spend some time with them and you might come to not even notice it anymore. Uh, we've already talked about lights and, and loud music. You know, Often if you go into a club right, and, and the bass is just thumping and the bass is thumping so hard, it feels like the bass is going to push your heart right out your back. right? And you go, oh my god, it's so loud. But, you know, after 10, 15 minutes, we're over there, over to the DJ saying, hey, man, turn that shit up, right? Sensory adaptation. Now, thresholds. And this is really what our assignment is about. I'm going to give you example thresholds that are kind of established. Your mission is going to be to cook up your own. So you're going to get with your partner, and, and you're going to think in terms of testing these things in a laboratory. More on that in a little bit. But the absolute threshold is defined as how much energy does it take to trigger the sensory apparatus to say something is there, right? Because let's face it, that, that we have in infinite increments of energy from nothing to full on, right? Well, where along that scale of energy intensity is the first point where it will trigger the sensory apparatus that is register on the sensory apparatus? 
And what we find, and what you're going to do in your assignment, is look at the different senses. So we take a sense, we look at the threshold, let's like take a look at light. Now one way, and, and I don't think you'll be able to do this in the laboratory, and I want you to kind of confine your um, discussion to maybe laboratory experimentation, although you'll see in the assignment uh, I'm not being a total hard ass on that. Light, candle flame, 30 miles away in the dark. You look in the dark and you say, oh my god, there's a candle flame, and I, I can register that there's light. Right, so that one candle creates enough light for me to actually have my retina activated. That's crazy to think about 30 miles away. Now, what does this mean? Okay, it means that if I take a smaller candle and put it at that distance, then I might not detect it, right? Or if I take that same candle and move it back to 31 miles, then uh, what this is stating is it will not register. Notice the candle's still there, it's still emitting light but the light energy isn't crossing the threshold to trigger my sensory apparatus on my retina. Now sound, and this is, this is an old school one, so I don't know what we're going to do with this one. We need to replace this one, and this is part of the reason for the assignment. That is, if we put someone in a quiet room, an absolutely quiet room, they should be able to hear the tick of a watch tick, 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 20 feet away. Now if we move that watch to 21 feet, What's the deal? Well, then it shouldn't register in the auditory sensory apparatus. Okay? And notice, how many of us have watches that tick? That's becoming pretty uncommon. Although, the thing about watches is interesting. You know, once people started carrying around cell phones, etc., and we always have the time available to us, there's predictions that the watch market would go would go kaput. But in fact, people are still buying watches, so I, I think watches also perform the function, obviously, of convenience, being on the wrist and not having to take something else out. But also, watches often make a fashion statement, uh, a form of jewelry, if you will. Taste. Okay? One drop of sugar and two gallons of water is enough to go. <laughs> but if you put half a teaspoon of sugar in that two gallons of water, then there should be no taste sensation. Uh, the, that's below the threshold at that point. So you guys, again, you're going to figure out replacements for these. Smell, well, one drop of perfume in a three-bedroom apartment. And uh, just imagine your partner walks into your apartment. You've got a three-bedroom apartment. Someone else has been there, and they go, mm, who's been here, right? And you're busted. Don't try that at home, right? So let, let's, let's find a new one. One drop of perfume in that three-bedroom apartment. And then finally, touch, and, and this, is, I, this is an example, because I want you guys to kind of have fun with this, if you're willing, right, is for touch. The wing of a bee falling on a cheek from one centimeter. So we need a bee wing or some equivalent, right? We don't really want to pull the wing off a bee, so we'll use some kind of equivalent, right? And we'll weigh, you know, and, and then we'll put the person in some kind of device that holds them still, and then we'll blindfold them so they can't see, and, and then we drop it on their cheek and we say, tell me when something happens, right? And, and so I... I think that would be a crazy experiment to design and watch. But it's up to you guys. So here's where you're going to go. Imagine you're mad scientists, if you will. Have some fun with it. And your pairs. I'd like you to develop a potential test of sensory threshold for each of these senses. Light, taste, smell, sound, and touch. Explain the laboratory field setup. And notice I'm saying you could do this in the field if you want. I like laboratory experimentation because I'm a, you know... I'm trained as a social psychologist uh, primarily in, in laboratory uh, research. But, but if you want to do it in the field, that's fine too. The problem with this kind of study in the field is there's a lot of factors that could probably affect the results uh, that you can't control for. So that's why we do that stuff in the laboratory. But you know all that, right? So pick, but then, okay, so explain the laboratory field setup. And I know you guys want to ask, well, how long should that be? And really, uh, we we're just talking a couple sentences here, a short paragraph, if you will. So maximum is maybe like a two-page paper type double spaced, right? And then finally, step three, pick any one of the five and modify the experiment to demonstrate just notable difference principle and Weber's law. And you're going, well, what, what the hell is that? I'm glad you asked. So thresholds, the difference threshold, and notice, this is where we're really kind of adapted to, was noticing differences, changes, as we discussed just a tad earlier. The difference threshold is the smallest amount by which a stimulus can be changed for us to notice the difference, right? Uh, 
So this is also known as the just noticeable difference. And I like to use a volume knob because, let's face it, it's got numbers on it, it's quantifiable. So the idea now is, if I am, let's say, playing a tone, to what extent, how much do I have to turn that knob for someone to say, it's now louder or it's now softer, right? And again, there must be some kind of micro movement that I can make that people can't detect a difference. Got that? So you're going to set that up for one of the senses, your choice. And then, let's talk about Weber's law. The just noticeable difference is always large when the stimulus intensity is high, small when the stimulus intensity is low. So if you imagine, and we take a look at that volume knob, and, and like used to happen when I was a teenager, I'd be playing music, uh, you know. Uh, in fact, I was listening to Led Zeppelin one last night just for nostalgia purposes, and this is an album I would have listened to back in the day, right? My mom comes home from work, and, and I got this thing pumping, right? I got the volume way the hell up, listening to Led Zeppelin. What does she say when she walks in that door? My mom says, turn that shit down. And <laughs> And, no, she probably didn't say shit, although that was one of her favorite words, but no, not really, but, but my mom knew how to swear, but you know, that, that's being a businesswoman, you learn that kind of stuff, right? And, and so I'm a smart aleck teenager, what do I do? Well, I got it on eight, so what do I do? I turn it like, you know, kind of like, I minutely move it, and she says, I said turn that stuff down, and what do I then say? I did, because I'm a smart ass, right? The idea was I didn't turn it down enough so that she could notice the difference, the just noticeable difference. Now, the weird thing about this is when it's high, high intensity, I have to turn it more. And let's think about that. If I have the volume set at max 10, right, and I turn it to 9, which is one notch on the dial, one notch, okay, so it goes from 10 to 9, what is the percentage reduction that I made? And simple math says it's like 10%, right? But let's suppose I was being a responsible citizen, which I rarely was as a teenager, but that's another story, right? Let's suppose that I have it at 2, and I turn it down one notch to 1. Now notice, I've turned it down a notch. I turned it down a notch the first time, I'm turning it down one notch the second time. But going from 2 to 1, what is the reduction there? And rough math says that's a 50% reduction. So this is Weber's law. Notice when the intensity is high, moving at one notch only represented a 10% reduction. When the intensity was low, moving at one notch represented a 50% reduction. So figure that out. Take these two ideas, the difference threshold and Weber's law, and help the, use those to help inform your choice of which sense you want to talk about in that final part of the assignment. Let's just finish it up real quick. Transduction then, as we talked, was as the sensory action potential activated by physical stimulation that causes an, electric, uh, uh, an electrical change in the receptor cells. And, that's, and the receptor cells are in different locations, right? And the processing is done in different parts of the brain, but we're not talking perception right now. We're talking sensation. So smell is in the olfactory receptor cells. So the olfactory cells are at the base of the brain, right? And, and they extend into the nose. And uh, it's a, this is the most primitive, probably, sensory apparatus we have is sense of smell. And you see it, it really in an old, ancient part of the brain. Taste, right? Taste buds primarily on the top of the tongue, okay? And, and go essentially to the same area. Pain is, is uh, delta fibers and, and C fibers that, that, that run as nerves through the body, right? But then touch threshold doesn't necessarily indicate pain. Hearing is, is a very strange system of these cilia Right, <laughs> the the really strange idea: the cilia that move as a result of vibrations that are transduced from sound pressure. So you saw the story in your in your book. I, I think the the mechanics of hearing, right, the physics of hearing are just fascinating. Uh, and then vision, and, and you know, one of the senses that we rely on to the greatest extent is photo photoreceptor cells on the retina. We'll talk a little bit more about that 
in our next lecture up. And that's it. So I hope you kind of just have fun with the assignment. Uh, it's just designed to help us explore how sensory apparatus works and uh, how sensation the level, the impact of sensation is different. One more thing I should probably say though is when we talk about these uh, absolute thresholds for activation, note that there's individual differences. So some people will have hearing that's more sensitive and it takes less activation for them to understand that a sound has been made. Uh, super tasters have a more refined system of detecting differences in taste than, than the rest of us do. So we have to allow then uh, for, uh, and as we age, as, as we become older, then the flexibility of the sensory apparatus tends to deteriorate. So. Uh, we don't taste as well as we get older. We often don't hear as well. We often don't see as well because of, of these apparatus that deteriorate. They're biological mechanisms that deteriorate over time. And that's all I got for you on this one. So enjoy your homework assignment, and you guys have a great day.